Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, July 23, the regular meeting of the Lane County Board of Commissioners. Welcome to all here at Harris Hall, as well as those of you in our television viewing audience. Thank you for stopping by and watching your local government at work. Today we have a uh, busy day. Uh, we are going to have our regular meeting starting now and continuing till approximately 12 noon and then uh, going till from 1.30 until um, the mid-afternoon um, and then starting up at 5.30 p.m. we'll have public comment right here in Harris Hall as well as uh, commissioner remonstrance uh, or response to public comment. And we also have a uh, work session tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, the July 24, with our uh, uh, patients Willingham, Winningham, our emergency program manager and county council Steve Dingle on emergency services briefing. So that'll be a three hour um, work session uh, for the board. Today, under adjustments to uh, the agenda, I have, we have a time certain at 10 a.m. We'll take up the item right after the time certain that's listed on the agenda, uh, another uh, labor matter uh, right after that, 10 a.m. time certain. We have 11 15 a.m. time certain, that is an executive session time certain, and we'll be going back to the board room for the executive session at 11.15. And then under uh, Commissioner, um, Commissioner Business for agenda team requests, uh, I know that Commissioner Buck has both the uh, Good Neighbor Authority and the uh, travel lane bicycle uh, item that'll be brought up. And I'd like you to make sure you bring it up under item 12 uh, B. <clears throat> um, are there any other uh, adjustments to the agenda on the part of commissioners before I turn to Mr. Mokerheisky and ask if there are any adjustments on the part of county administration? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Mokerheisky, okay. Very good. Uh, we'll move on to item two, emergency business. I don't have any emergency business, none, okay. We'll now go to our public comments. Each person will be given three minutes. I'll call your name, please come up to the front row and then come up to the microphone. Uh, Lauren Moe will be our first person, followed by Leah Moore and Catherine Gallagher. So, uh, Ms. Moore, if you could come up to the first row, and Ms. Mo, if you could come up to the microphone, please give your name and please uh, tell us where you live. And please then our vice chair, Commissioner Buck, will set the timer and give you three minutes. Welcome. Okay. Good morning. I'm Lauren Mo. I live in South Eugene, and Pete Sorensen is my commissioner. Um, today I want to talk about the Nurse Midwifery Birth Center and what it's provided me and my family in terms of community and support. Um, so a little over four years ago, I um, went seeking a um, prenatal care that was a little bit alternative to what I was receiving at my OBGYN um, at 28 weeks pregnant. Um, I wanted to know the person delivering my baby and to be truly supported in um, the birth process and afterward. Um, and what I didn't know I would get in return beyond incredible um, individualized service and lactation services um, was a community of fellow mom friends um, that to this day I have really strong relationships with. Um, and as an exhausted new mom, I showed up every week at the, um, at the birth clinic um, for the baby weigh-in um, baby clinics. Um, where you get your baby weighed, you can talk to other moms, um, you can talk to lactation consultants, um, get help, you know, with those, any issues you're having or questions. Um, and um, that just turned into be such a huge value to me. Um, within the first few months of my son's birth, I met several other moms with babies around the same age who also were going through those same things, not sleeping at night, um, you know, wondering if you're doing the right things or why your baby's upset or um, not taking naps when they should be. Um, and um, so other, those other moms were also seeking that connection and support for lactation services. Um, 
being a new mom can be isolating and confusing, and there I made those friendships that um, felt me, made me felt less alone and truly part of a community. Um, because of the birth center, my sons and I are part of a group that has met for four years now, every other Wednesday evening um, at 5.30 p.m. at someone's house. We alternate homes and um, we continue to do that every other Wednesday. And those are the moms that I text when you know we're having behavior issues or I have questions or sleep issues or we're just um, laughing about what's going on with our kiddos and our families. So, um, so I found the birth center um, to be an incredible support to our family and many moms in our community. Um, commissioners, I'm here to ask you today to secure an important work session with key stakeholders, including yourselves, the Lane County Friends of the Birth Center, Peace Health, Oregon Health Authority, and the governor's office. <gasps> We need decisive leadership now so that our community continue its decade-long access to safe and affordable care at freestanding accredited birth center. Um, so thank you for your support. Thank you very much. So Leah Moore, Catherine Gallagher, Alyssa Wagner, David Wax, and David Pachone. <coughs> Good morning, uh, my name is Leah Moore and this is my three month old son, Alistair, who was born at the Nurse Midwifery Birth Center. We live southeast of Eugene in unincorporated Lane County on the way to Mount Pisgah and Heather Buck is uh, my commissioner. Um, becoming a mother is more than a physical experience. There's a huge and often minimized mental and emotional component to birth itself and the environment in which you give birth matters. A woman's surroundings during labor and delivery influence her comfort and stress levels, which can impact birth outcomes. This in turn can affect not only her physical well-being, but her mental and emotional well-being postpartum as well. Um, and we all know uh, how serious postpartum depression and anxiety can be. Um, I was fortunate to deliver at the birth center but due to a complication, had to be transferred shortly afterward to the hospital. So I have experienced both environments, and I was thankful to have uh, the hospital nearby since I did need it. I had a medical need, um, but I was doubly thankful to have had the opportunity to actually deliver at the birth center. Um, the advantage to the birth center is continuity, not only of care, but of the environment throughout pregnancy, birth, and the postpartum period. During my childbirth classes, I was actually able to spend time in the room where I gave birth and familiarize with it, myself with it and imagine myself actually becoming a mother there. Um, the birth center was a comfortable, home-like, and known environment when I arrived there in labor. Uh, the importance of support in the postpartum period cannot be understated, and the birth center fosters a unique sense of community before and after birth. Um, I feel like Lauren just described my life right now <laughs> of not sleeping and having all kinds of questions and having that built-in um, support network that I get to go to every week uh, with weekly baby, baby clinics um, is absolutely invaluable. Um, child. Um, yeah, the childbirth classes and the baby clinics have allowed me to meet other moms and babies. And I often run into and get to continue working with the nurses, lactation consultants, and midwives who cared for me prior to, during, and directly after my birth. Um, the lactation consultant and nurse who actually attended um, and assisted the midwife at his birth is here today. Um, and I regularly run into her um, uh, for to get lactation support and weigh him and, and things. So the level of welcome, comfort, and support that I feel at the birth center cannot be replicated in a hospital environment. It is more than a medical facility. It is a sacred space where I became a mother, where I discovered the depth of my power and strength, and where I have formed strong and lasting bonds with my care providers and my peers. I hope I will have the opportunity to keep visiting and engaging with this space that has become a spiritual home. I urge you commissioners to move forward with the proposed commissioner's work session to bring together Lane County Friends of the Birth Center, Peace Health Yourselves, and the Oregon Health Authority so that we can um, help preserve access to this birth center. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Gallagher, uh, Alyssa Wagner, David Wax, David Piccioni. 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Katherine Gallagher. I live in Eugene, and my elected representative is Commissioner Sorensen. In 2009, the community raised 65% of the $1.2 million needed to build the new Nurse Midwifery Birth Center in Springfield. Peace Health contributed the remaining portion through sale of the old building. While Peace Health will say otherwise, the Nurse Midwifery Birth Center is a community asset. It should not be wrested away by misguided, prideful leaders who refuse every overture for engagement around this community health asset. As you head into the July 31 work session devoted to this issue, please consider the wisdom of allowing the least engaged and least informed stakeholder, Peace Health, to call all of the shots for the rest of us. The Peace Health, that Peace Health so casually presses its financial, political, and bureaucratic influence to bend our community to its will should not be tolerated. Peace Health does not know better than local stakeholders, including 10,000 petition signatures, 65 donors in a public letter, 29 physician and healthcare providers in an open letter to the community, Central Latino Americano, Congressman Peter DeFazio, Representative Marty Wilde, Eugene Councilor Emily Simple, most, I hope, of the Lane County Board of Commissioners, and just now the Democratic Party of Lane County, which has passed a support resolution. Do not accept assurances that, pe that women's care, a private business, will swoop in and take over the, pre the prenatal clinic. This is a high stakes gamble. When women's care inevitably grows tired of the challenges involved, we are likely looking at a referral system where OHP insured women, many contending with significant transportation, economic, and language barriers, will be sent out into a private service landscape, which currently is not prepared and unlikely wants to be. Do not accept assurances that all women will just accept Peace Health and Women's Care's fiat to accept the obstetric model of care and hospital birth. Both are said to be surprised by this. Do they not know our community? Obstetric and hospital care are more expensive, more invasive, and associated with outcomes many women in this community wish to avoid, including a nearly 40% cesarean section rate at Riverbend. Friends of the Birth Center is hearing from women and community organizations about women currently cobbling together plans to avoid hospital birth. Please use the work session to ask and require answers of Health and Human Services that will clear a path forward toward a needed next chapter, one that retains access to an independent midwifery-run practice and out-of-hospital birth. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Wagner, Mr. Wax, Mr. Piccioni. Hi, my name is Alyssa Wagner, and I live in South Eugene. Sorensen is my commissioner, and I'm speaking on behalf of being a patient of the Nurse Midwifery Birth Center. Um, I had my first child 11 years ago, and I can't explain to you that um, how healing that experience was for me. Um, not to go into detail of my past, of my how I was raised, but it was very healing, and I never would have expected that that was the ability to heal me and make me the mother that I am today. Um, the midwives, they empower and educate women to be able to be empowered to make their own decision and to con take control of their own health care needs. And that is an invaluable experience that women will be missing out on without this model of care in our community. Um, the support that they provide before, during, and after is not anywhere else in this community. There is no plan for that support to continue. As these women have identified, my kids are a little older, um, but they are in the trenches of that time of their life, and they do provide that support. And as you guys know, the, the way the mothers are treating their babies are how we're going to change our community health. Um, breastfeeding is the number one thing to increase community health when you look at 20, 2020 health, healthy people goals, breastfeeding is huge. Um, and it is hard. It's hard without the support you need from medical professionals. Um, the community that the birth center provides is 
nowhere else to be found. I, I, as a patient, did birth to three, and that I didn't find my community even there with that. It wasn't until the wellness baby clinics that I attended every week where I found the community and support I needed. 24-hour um, lactation support, if there's anything that's going on, you're allowed to call and get somebody on the phone at any hour of the night. I don't know anywhere else that that's something that mothers can take advantage of, and as you know, it's a it's a huge burden relieved from your mental, you know, from having that support in the middle of the night when you need it. It can really help. Um, so with that, I hope you understand the community, um, how much we're gonna lose out on the health of our families and our community without this model of care and out of hospital birth. I had both babies at the birth center and it was just, it's undescribable to be honest, and it just provides a experience that every woman should have the right to experience. And with that, I ask that you ensure a work session with the important stakeholders, including yourselves, Lane County Friends of the Birth Center, Peace, Peace Health, Oregon Health Authority, and the Governor's Office. We need decisive leadership now so that our community can continue its decades-long access to safe and affordable health care in our freestanding accredited birth center. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David Wax and David Piccioni. Good morning, commissioners. My name is David Wax, and I live in um, Commissioner Sorensen's district. I speak not only as the father of a child whose birth was attended by the midwives, but also as someone who is concerned with maintaining and expanding women's choices in the type of health care they receive, as well as making available to Lane County residents low-cost, evidence-based health care that improves health outcomes for Lane County. When I say evidence-based, I mean that the model of care practiced by the certified nurse midwives working under their own clinical direction is directly informed by research. That is not always the case when midwives work under the clinical direction of obstetricians who tend to favor more aggressive medical interventions that carry additional risks, are far more expensive, and lower health outcomes in the aggregate. Nurse midwifery care is healthier for Lane County. The World Health Organization recommends a population level cesarean section rate of 10%. The current US national cesarean rate is 31%. The nurse midwifery birth center's rate is approximately 15%, which is still over the WHO target, but one half of the national average and well under one half of Riverbend's current rate. In short, when the majority of births happen at a nurse midwifery birth center, the population is healthier. That is why a recent study in the Journal of Midwifery and Women's Health states very plainly that, quote, policymakers, that's you, in the United States should consider supporting the birth center model to improve local, state, and national maternal outcomes, end quote. From the perspective of public expenditure, an in-hospital birth, in -hospital birth with no complications attended by an obstetrician can cost between 200 to 300 percent more than a normal birth attended by the certified nurse midwives in a freestanding birth center. Research supports that for the majority of births, nurse midwifery birth centers provide quality, comparable, or better outcomes than hospitals. Finally, birth center care is indicated for Medicaid recipients. The women currently served by the midwives at the county clinic are receiving state-of-the-art care. A 2019 article by Joels et al. in the journal Birth states very plainly that, quote, midwifery-led birth center care is the type of care that Medicaid beneficiaries need, end quote. Closing the birth center would decrease the quality of care for Lane County recipients of Medicaid, and the adage, um, it's attributed variously to Winston Churchill and Mahatma Gandhi, among other people, um, but no less true for its uncertain uh, attribution, that uh, a society should be judged by the treatment, its treatment of the most vulnerable members um, continues to be true, and I believe it to be true. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Okay, um, David Piccioni. Hello. Um, I think that uh, a mid a birth uh, with the assistance of a midwife is ideal. I think it's the best way to do it. Uh, I do support programs where uh, uh, prospective mothers and fathers receive uh, uh, 
information and uh, uh, help and uh, support at this uh, very crucial part of their lives or the lives of their babies if they decide to have them, if they decide to have them. Uh, I, I am a supporter of, of uh, the choice of a woman to have a child, uh, which means that uh, I, 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 well, um, I don't think that having an abortion is a completely, uh, it's, it's an action that has no consequences. I do believe that babies do have some kind of inter interuterine experience that should be cherished if possible, but I think that in a lot of cases when the parents cannot have the capacity to raise a child, uh, it is the best option, and I would hope that the county would uh, present the option of uh, any woman that wa wants to have an abortion or care of, of their child, either way, uh, to have full support from the, from the community and from you guys and uh, the doctors and the... Uh, uh, the midwives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we have uh, additional people who've signed up. And thank you for uh, signing up. We have uh, Rob Dickinson, Marshall Goss. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Bernadette Barassa. Welcome. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Rob Dickinson from Unincorporated Cottage Grove. Um, I'm here today to urge action on referral of the ballot measures that we've brought before you before. Um, at the most recent public comments work session in Springfield, there were a great many people that came out urging the commissioners to hold a joint work session on this topic, and that is what I'm here today to ask you to do. Um, we would like to see you take action on that today to um, to vote as commissioners to hold that work session and to schedule it. At the last uh, public comment session, we, uh, we believe we saw at least three commissioners who indicated support for going forward with that, so we hope that um, the next step will be taken, which will be to schedule that. Um, I'd also like today to talk about um, how we hope that work session will happen. Um, uh, we would like to have the... Um, the work session really focus on the reasons why it is appropriate to refer, in particular, the, the, the democracy aspects of that, the fact that so many people have signed petitions urging a vote on this. Um, we don't believe that it would be in anyone's best interest to have this be a work session on the pros and cons of aerial spraying. You know, we've brought before you many, many times over the last year and a half, many people who have given quite a lot of testimony and personal experiences. Um, we don't think the county is really equipped to have that kind of a work session on the scientific merits of aerial spraying. It would be something that would take weeks and require lots of expert testimony. What we think is appropriate is really to talk about why the public has called for this and why the commissioners have the ability to give the public what they want. Um, in terms of such a work session, um, we think the important thing when we asked for it before was the joint in asking for a joint work session. We, we want it to be such that we are represented there, that we can have representatives of, of um, Community Rights, Rights Line County, a group that I'm part of, as well as the two ballot measure committees who brought forward those previous initiatives. Those would be Freedom from Aerial Herbicides Alliance and Our Community, Our Rights. Have those three groups have representatives there as well as their legal counsel uh, who can talk about the legal issues involved. Um, some of the topics we think should be covered. Um, we've heard um, the county council come here and speak about separate vote and so forth. We think that it's important that, um, that our legal expert be able to talk about the relatively unprecedented nature of the treatment that the initiatives had, and we, because that does re reflect on the um, on, on why. Um, we also think the liability concern that some commissioners have raised should be discussed, and we'd like to have our legal expert be able to weigh in on that. So again, I, I would urge the commissioners to take uh, action today to schedule that and to make it be a work session that works for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, and Marshall, I'm sorry, sir, I probably mispronounced your name, so please give us your correct pronunciation. You got it, thanks. Marshall Gauze, yes. Um, I'm in uh, Lane County, um, Cottage Grove in the Heather Bucks District. Um, I want to encourage you as well to hold the work session on a referral of the ballot initiatives. Um, 
I, I believe that it'd be a perfect opportunity to have all of the questions in, in terms of the uh, legality and the democratic uh, aspect of it aired, both sides um, in terms of the county's concern, in terms of um, the the uh, committees that have referred them to have legal counsel there. And I believe that, that as uh, uh, Rob Dickinson said, focusing on the uh, democracy aspect and access to the ballot is the key to keep that a streamlined, focused session. Um, we're not here to uh, incur to change anyone's mind about aerial spray. That's something that the uh, citizens can discuss once it's on the ballot. Uh, the real question is that the will of the people be respected. Um, more than 15,000 signatures were collected on two different petitions. Um, uh, for to, to get this onto the ballot and because of a number of unprecedented uh, steps they've been deprived so I would encourage you to today to make a decision on when to schedule that and let uh, both sides know and uh, we look forward to uh, discussing that further thank you thank you okay and Bernard Barrasso welcome please come to the microphone tell us where you live and uh, you'll have three minutes welcome Thank you. My name is Bernadette Barraza. I live in Heather Bucks District, uh, Lane, Lane County. Um, I'm very distracted by all these babies. I hope you guys are <laughs> paying more attention than I can. Uh, and I'm here today to talk about that, although I do hope you have the work session on the aerial spray ban. But uh, I birthed all five of my babies at home with the services of midwives, and this was in the ancient days when there wasn't a birth center, but the experience of birthing at home was really wonderful. And I'm not going to criticize hospital births at all. If a woman needs a cesarean, that's fine. Whatever that woman who is in labor and birthing a human being is, uh, is needing that we can provide her with. I think it's to our benefit as a society to provide that. Um, and I would be advocating for more services rather than less. Uh, hey, if we could go over and clean her house and bring food and do the laundry for a few months, I'm sure they would appreciate it. Um, and many women of birth, childbirthing age can't be here today. They have jobs, they have young children at home. Maybe they just, whatever reason. And the reasons for wanting the services of a midwife are many. I, I think you can imagine. It, it's the idea of having the choice there to birth at home if you're more comfortable at home. Maybe you have an autoimmune disease and you shouldn't be in a hospital. Uh, maybe you're autistic. Uh, Maybe you like dark rooms in the comfort of your own bed or a birth center's more home-like atmosphere than being in a hospital. It, it doesn't matter what the reason is. Um, giving birth was one of the most difficult things that I've gone through in my life. Um, it's, it's not easy and that woman is really all alone. You can have lots of doctors or nurses around you, but you're kind of all alone when anything hits the fan. It's, uh, you just gotta like be grateful for the people that are giving you ice chips and back rubs and soft words of encouragement, but you're all alone. And uh, whatever they want, let's give it to them. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that's uh, uh, here that has not signed up for public comment that wants to make public comment? Okay. Uh, well, it's no no redos, <laughs> Mr. Piccioni. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. We are going to move on to our. Oh, we do have someone. Thank you. If you could come forward, give your name slowly so I could write it down, and then we'll start your three minutes. Sure. Hi, my name is Ren McLemore, M-C-L-E-M-O-R-E. -E. I'm in um, South Eugene. My commissioner is Commissioner Sorensen, and I, um, I gave birth to this beautiful girl in September of 2017 at the birth center. Um, Beyond that, I had the most amazing care I've ever had. 
by the midwives in the prenatal clinic um, over here in town. And it was, um, you know, from anything that birth could have been, all of the complications, everything went by so smoothly and the midwives gate provided me with the best health care I've ever had in my entire life. And um, this little girl came in her own time, 18 hours after my water broke, and I, I was given, <laughs> she's loving the microphone, um, I was just given um, lots of presence and care and uh, I, I have no doubt that my natural birth and my ability to give birth safely and in the best possible way was all in part because of the care that I received at the birth center and from the midwives and also from the lactation consultants um, postpartum. Uh, I went through, <laughs> pardon me, we're gonna have to cut this short, but I, I do support the Peace Health, um, keeping the birth center alive. I do believe that um, this is an important staple in our community that needs to be preserved. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, well thank you for all of your public comment today. Uh, next we'll move on to item number four, which is our commissioner response to public comments or other issues and remonstrance. And are there any commissioners that wish to be recognized? Okay, Commissioner Buck. I just wanna thank everybody who came, including the little ones. I said it before we started, but I just wanna repeat for people, you know, when little ones come, don't feel like you have to shush them or take them away. Um, they're just talking and that's okay and I want them to feel included in our meeting. Um, so don't feel like you have to constantly, you know, shh, or anything like that. Um, I love having children here at our meetings um, and I think it, um, I just want to appreciate everybody who's coming out. I know that we are having our meeting next Wednesday as you've mentioned and I look forward to having that bigger discussion about options in our community for women. Uh, I also love to see more options, uh, uh, especially for women's health care. Um, you know, I, I had mentioned this before, I, I had my child at the, at the hospital and had a wonderful experience, um, but it is awkward when you don't necessarily know who your doctor is going to be. It turns out my doctor she was the one that birthed my primary doctor's child. So, you know, it's, it's a tight community um, and there, sh but there should be options for everybody. And so um, again, I look forward to that discussion next week. Okay, other commissioners, Commissioner Farr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, thanks for being here this morning. Uh, seeing babies is, is always uh, one of the high points of the day. And I'm gonna, the next thing I'm gonna say, Lee, I'm gonna talk to you directly. Uh, the high point of my, I've, I've had a long day already. The high point has already been Alistair giving me a beautiful smile mm -hmm. about 15 minutes ago. That was, that's made my day, I can go home now. So see you guys later. Uh, but you also, the, the other thing I'll point out is that you had uh, planned a, uh, a natural childbirth, but you had complications and you were taken, you went to the hospital for the completion of the childbirth. That happened with our youngest child. Um, our uh, Luke, who lives in San Francisco now, uh, we had planned a, a, a home birth, a natural home birth, and it did, did not work out. So we had a plan, an emergency plan, which all of you all have, an emergency plan, if complications arise. It's not, uh, you're in the finest of hands with your, in the birth center, but should complications arise, uh, you have nearby, a plan for nearby help, such as we had, and it, and it was a blessing at the time. That was in the ancient days, <laughs> back in the uh, 1980s. Uh, prior to that, in even more ancient days, we had a birth center uh, birth with our young middle son, uh, Evan, at Lucinia Birth Center, which is no longer here, but uh, once again, it, it was quiet, there was no beeping, no, no loud sounds. Uh, one of the most comfortable experiences that I personally have ever experienced, and I've been at four births, um, uh, three of my children, one of my grandchildren. And it's, it's uh, and our first child was born in the hospital with monitors and 
beeping and loud noises, and, and he was a forcep delivery because of meconium. Um, it was an emergency process. I don't know how much they use that today, but, uh, but once again, it was an emergency situation, and the help was there. I have every single bit of confidence that you, as parents, know exactly how you want to bring your children into this, uh, into this world, and we're going to back you up in that. I'm going to back you up in that. And it's not just rhetoric. It's not just, I back you up. This is a real deal. Uh, what you're asking for is not out of the question, and it's not something that is out of the realm of us as a board and as a county being able to help you. So thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for, once again, your testimony that you provided that uh, really helps us to uh, see things in a, in, a true, in a clearer view than if uh, we just read what you were talking about on paper. Bringing your babies here is fantastic. The second thing, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to talk about this more during agenda team requests. And I see that one of my two, and in the pages of agenda team requests we have, I have two. Uh, one of them has been pushed way down to the bottom of the list to be determined. Uh, agenda, the, the kind, mm -hmm. kindness letter uh, regarding uh, the county of kindness. Uh, on November 3rd, there's going to be a, a large event uh, here in town, um, and two of our doctors are going to be speaking at that event on kindness. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ludke and um, Dr. Kincaid are going to be speaking at that event. It's urgent that we take this up, um, that the, the TBD on this be changed to uh, a, a date certain. I'll take that up during agenda team requests. Thank you very much. Okay, other commissioners? Commissioner ba uh, Bernie? We're easily confused, I understand. I agree. <laughs> Both start with B. <laughs> um, first, uh, I will not bore you and enumerate the journeys of the births of my wife's and my six children, nor the births of our two grandchildren. I think it's pretty clear that the question becomes, where are our hearts and where is the authority and the wheelhouse of the county? My, I would request that, is Ms. Gallagher, Ms. Gallagher's, I would request a copy of, of your statement because I thought you had a lot of interesting facts and information there, if that would be possible. Um, my understanding from emails we've been forwarded is that Peace Health has chosen not, is that correct, Steve, to participate in a work session? Correct. Um, so we have, um, but but has agreed to review questions and what have you. So I hope that, um, you know, we have certain authorities and certain authorities we don't have. Our hearts, in my opinion, are in the right place. Um, as with Heather, the more kids noise, the more profoundly truthful I find the testimony. <laughs> Um, and so I just, I just wanted to make those comments and I look forward to the session as well. Um, the second thing is I just want um, uh, Rob and Marshall to know that, that, I, you know, that, that I did share our meeting, um, that I did forward um, your interests in, in format. I have no idea how we will deal with that. I think that will be discussed later in the agenda. But I wanted to let you know that. Uh, and that's all I have at this point in time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. And I just want to thank um, the supporters of the Birth Center for coming in. Um, you know, I, I'm probably the only commissioner up here that does not have children. <laughs> so I, I haven't gone through the experience and all that stuff, but did watch every season of Call the Midwife. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, wanting that, that setting um, to have have your birth. But, you know, once again, I, I, I urge you to work, try and work through the state. We don't have the power to force Peace Health to come to a work session. In fact, they've basically said they're not going to be at the work session. So it's going to be us talking about the birth center, which really isn't going to achieve a whole lot. Um, the way to get peace health to the table is through the folks that actually write the statutes and also enforce those statutes, which is at the state level. You know, one of the issues going on here is the fact that in Oregon, a midwife has to operate under the supervision of an OB. You know, and that's a state statute that is not a county statute. And the, you know, so. Talking with Representative Wildey, who you've got support from and all that, you know, you might want to talk to them because that's one of the reasons why the birth centers in the situation it is, is the, the supervising OBs are basically 
pulling their support. You know, and that, that's a statutory issue, not, not a county rule, not a, a county public health thing. It's purely Oregon statute. So I, I can't urge you enough to, you know, your effort and the time you spent developing your testimony and coming here and talking to us <laughs> really needs to be spent you know, with the governor's office, your state representatives and your state senators, because those are the folks that control that system you know, and, and and licensing uh, and and all that goes into that. So uh, that's really where I, I, I hope you can put some of your focus because I think that's ultimately where the system needs to change to save places like the birth center. Yeah, you know, while you have to still operate under the direct supervision of you know, the standardized health system and they just decide that you guys aren't making enough money and, and you're actually losing money, so we're gonna we're just gonna terminate that. They can just do that because you guys can't operate standalone. So that there's there's changes that need to be made in the system, not really not a whole lot we can do here. And my understanding is, you know, Peace Health has said they won't attend a work session, so I'm not quite sure what we're gonna do during that work session. Um, I want to real quick just mention that, you know, one of the solutions to the issue of the petitions is circulate new petitions as an, an ordinance and you'll get past the separate vote issue because it's an ordinance. Um, my question is, is if the recall effort that's currently going on fails and over 30,000 Lane County residents sign that recall petition, are we going to hold a work session about referring a recall, you know, to the ballot? It, you know, it, when does it end? When, when do we, when does our responsibility um, you know, for helping somebody get on the ballot versus them taking care and doing it themselves? You know, there is an option for the aerial spray and the community rights to get on our ballot, circulate correct petitions. That, that's, the, that's the simple thing there. And I want to briefly digress and mention the recent passage by the city of Eugene of an income tax. I'm disappointed that there wasn't stronger communication between the city and the county in doing that first. I'm disappointed that folks like our new, our new sheriff and myself that live in the county and now work downtown are going to be paying that income tax to support public safety at the same time when the city has historically stood as a barrier for us to form public safety districts in the county by not allowing us to amend the metro plan. So we could charge our citizens for public safety without charging city of Eugene citizens. So while they stood as a barrier for us to resolve our public safety problems, they're now charging county residents to resolve theirs. And I just think that's taxation without representation and completely unfair. Okay, thank you. A um, Couple of things on my part. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Ms. Brasso, for pointing out that uh, during this incredible stressful time of motherhood that maybe we should uh, provide a little help like doing the laundry, maybe cleaning the house. And I recall uh, traveling in Denmark and that's exactly what they do in Denmark. Uh, they have a program to help uh, young families that are stressed and over uh, burdened with the demands of a new child and that's exactly what uh, they do is a recognize that the long-term economic cost associated with having a you know dysfunctional setting during the crucial time in a little person's life that maybe that help would be paid back many fold over over uh, not to mention the humanitarian component to it of really helping people um, so uh, with regard to the uh, uh, Nurse Midwifery Birth Center, you know, I, I guess um, I have a, a different take on this. It, you know, if the governor's office can't come because there's many other things the governor's dealing with, that really doesn't bother me. It actually doesn't even bother me that Peace Health doesn't want to come because 
they've made their decision, they're closing the birth center. What I think this, uh, we, of course, it had it turned out that they wanted to participate, maybe it'd be different, but now it's really, uh, our work session should be focused on what are we going to do as a community to make sure that we have a birth center. For many reasons Mr. Wax mentioned in his testimony, uh, we wanna be at the forefront of public health, of the way healthcare is delivered. Lane County has a tremendous responsibility in the field of health. Not only primary care of actually running clinics and hiring doctors, nurses, and other professionals, but also our broader public health responsibilities. So there may be a place within Lane County government to do this. Obviously, the law of economics applies to the government as well as to the to the Peace Health nonprofit sector, and if the number of births is falling uh, at the birth center and the uh, OBGYN that cur currently is overseeing the birth center uh, uh, until it closes, uh, you know, the issues of liability insurance and whatever, they don't go away just because the government steps in. But it could be that the government would play a role, or it could be the government plays the role in assisting a nonprofit, a future to be named nonprofit in, uh, in this. And we did the very same thing when we set up the federally qualified health centers uh, in terms of, of guiding the process of proposing the a federally qualified health center. Uh, I'm told that that people that run the federal health qualified health center uh, are not interested, that the model won't work for them. And I, I don't, I wanna fight with them over whether it would or would not. I wanna get to a yes where we see as a community uh, what our role is. Um, so that's what I hope we will accomplish next Wednesday morning when we have our work session on that topic. Now concerning the various ballot measures and Mr. Dickinson and Mr. Goss and others that have come, uh, first of all, we're having another public comment this session this evening. Um, secondly, at in this meeting today, uh, I'm hoping to ask Mr. Dingle about the opinion that he's written for the board's consideration and whether or not uh, there are uh, sufficient uh, interest on the part of the Board of Commissioners to release that opinion so that other people, yourself and many others, can look at that, scrutinize that, and um, and make any additional comments you want about it as we move toward a joint work session, which uh, on my own behalf, not speaking for the board, I think we should move towards a joint work session. The outcome of which I do not promise, uh, but I do think that we could in my view, uh, have that joint work session. Um, okay, um, and, and I've arranged for Mr. Dingle and, and thanks to Commissioner Bernie as well, we'll have a discussion of the release of that county council opinion and that will be listed as item 8B on our agenda today. Okay, um, and you can either stay around for that or you can be assured we will be talking about that on item 8B today. Uh, okay, Commissioner Farr, anything If I further? may, Mr. an item of interest to the folks testifying regarding uh, uh, medical uh, issues in Lane County, uh, item uh, B6 on our consent calendar, is not, we're not gonna discuss it today. Take a look at that, it's regarding medical residency and the availability of general health care in Lane County. Uh, this is a letter that we are uh, sending to the governor regarding medical re re residency. Take a look at that when you get a chance. It's on the consent calendar. Okay, um, anything further under commissioner response to public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll now move to our consent calendar. And uh, there are many, many items on it, uh, very important items. Uh, uh, and Commissioner Farr is correct. We are approving on the consent calendar our letter to the governor uh, concerning the need for medical residency in Lane County. Uh, that's part of it. Uh, many other items. Are there any items that any commissioner needs to take off of or wants to take off of the uh, consent calendar? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented. I'll move um, approval of item five, our consent calendar, as presented. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, moved by Commissioner Buck, second by Commissioner Bernie. 
to approve the consent calendar as, as presented in item five on our agenda and numerous board orders and actions. All those in favor, please say aye. Is there any discussion? Uh, usually not because, uh, but go ahead, go ahead. No, we I'm have pro, time. We I have apologize. Time. No, that's okay. We have time. I, say, I don't know. Um, I just want to just make a general comment and maybe this can be addressed later, but I noticed many of these are for large amounts and they're being sole sourced. And as I read through the materials, it did not look like there was a lot of competition for, for that. And, and not knowing the details and not questioning the details, for me, when there are so many sole sourced, non-competitive uh, scenarios, it just makes me wonder what the process was and, and did information get out. So I read through all the materials. I'll support uh, the consent calendar, but I did want to flag that. That's all for perhaps discussion later. Good. Thank you. And feel free uh, if you want to uh, propose an item for future uh, agenda team requests or work session Thank you. on that issue. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Uh, the consent calendar is approved by a vote of five to zero. All commissioners voting uh, and present voting yes and all orders and direction is approved. We now have uh, two items coming up uh, quickly. One is at 10 a.m. Uh, and one follows uh, shortly thereafter, both uh, labor management issues. And between now and then, uh, I'd like to call on uh, Mr. Uh, Mokrohyski, item 7A for any administration announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple here. Um, I sent the board an email last week. Uh, I attended the National Association of Counties annual conference um, in Clark County, Nevada last week. Um, I was there primarily for the National Association of County Administrators, uh, which I, I had shared with the board that um, I was elected the president-elect of NACA. Uh, for the next two years, and then um, I'll serve as the president of the National Association of County Administrators from July 2021 to July 2023. And I, again, I appreciate the board's support of uh, that role and the ability for our organization to tap into that national network uh, of, of peer county administrators to learn from and, and share information with. Uh, while at that, we had, um, we've really grown the relationship between that organization and NACO and uh, the National Association of Counties uh, as well as the International City Management um, Association. And we received an update from staff at NACO and they talked and then I subsequently attended the Jail Inmate Healthcare Task Force that's been created by NACO. This is an effort um, to look at the, the challenge created uh, when individuals are, um, uh, offenders are housed in the jail pre-trial uh, and then after conviction become inmates in the jail, uh, they lose Medicaid coverage or other, other private health insurance coverage if um, I should say Medica Medicaid or other public health insurance coverage. Um, and so the cost then of health care, providing health care to those individuals housed in the jail, either pre-trial or post conviction is on local residents. And so this uh, jail inmate healthcare task force is an effort uh, to look at various strategies to uh, allow for individuals in the jail to remain on Medicaid or other public health insurance um, and to work with the federal government to allow for that to happen. Um, one thing that we identified is that there is currently no Oregon co-sponsor of the federal legislation. Um, uh, that deals with this issue and we felt like one option for the board in addition to tracking this issue and being involved in NACO as, as you all attend those meetings and engage with your peers around the country um, is for us to advocate to our legislative delegation, particularly Congressman DeFazio and encourage um, co-sponsorship of that. So I wanted to put that forward uh, and maybe during your agenda team uh, requests, if that's something that you're interested in doing, you can have that discussion at that time. The second issue that I, and I'm happy to answer questions about that, Mr. Chair, if you have uh, any questions there. The second issue is I just wanted to provide an update on the um, request by Commissioner Sorensen at the June 11th meeting. We had some public testimony 
where individuals talked about the and the board has subsequently received a number of emails from residents um, expressing a desire to declare a state of emergency, a homeless state of emergency. And so the board's request was that staff research this issue and understand what other communities have done this, what have been the reasons for that, um, the benefits of it or challenges. So I sent an email to the board, but for uh, to make sure that this is part of the public record, wanted to also um, share that research with you. Jeff Kincaid, management analyst and county administration has done this research and identified that uh, most emergency declarations serve one of two purposes, either to raise awareness through a symbolic declaration or to enact specific aspect, uh, aspects already written into the code. Uh, Lane County, for our part, if we were to, if the board was to take an action declaring a homeless state of emergency, it would fall into the symbolic category since Lane County does not have relevant code language for this type of declaration. Um, the act of declaring an emergency in the absence of any related code uh, for Lane County uh, does not trigger any special authorizations or powers. Um, as an example, declaring a wildfire emergency does have more than symbolic power. So if the board would declare uh, a, a natural a, a wildfire emergency or natural other like natural disaster, that declaration would trigger explicit provisions in the Lane Code authorizing appropriation of funds, uh, the authority to order evacuations, uh, and so on. Um, so again, uh, uh, declaring a homeless uh, emergency is symbolic and no explicit provisions in the lane code are triggered by that sort of emergency. Uh, we're not aware of any grant programs that would become available to us as the result of, uh, of specifically declaring a homeless emergency. And then I wanted to share just a few of the communities, some of whom were noted during the public testimony. Um, the state of Hawaii declared an emergency. Um, that allowed for additional commitment of funds and suspended certain statutes that has been extended several times, most recently in August. Um, this says August 7th of 2019, but that would be difficult for that to have happened since we haven't hit that date yet. So this may have been 2018. King County, Washington uh, declared an emergency that stated uh, their immediate actions to address homelessness. Uh, requested assistance from Washington State and requested assistance from the United States. This is an example uh, of those that we researched where the declaration did not grant any additional authorities or access to funds, so King County's action would have fallen into the, the symbolic category. City of Seattle, I think was mentioned during the public testimony a few weeks ago, uh, declared an emergency that activated portions of the city charter, which granted the mayor additional authorities, uh, suspended certain laws, uh, requested assistance from Washington State and a request assistance from the United States. And finally, the city of Portland declared an emergency that activated portions of the city code granting additional authorities, allowed for additional commitment of funds and waived portions of the zoning code. And that has been uh, extended several times and runs through April 4th, 2021. My, my comment earlier about the Hawaii date is, is that their declaration runs through August 7th, 2019. So that would be an interesting to one to watch if they extend that. Those were all the updates. I know that was a lot of information. Uh, certainly can talk about another portion of the meeting, but I want to share that, uh, those updates with you now. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call uh, Ms. Nagel and Sheriff uh, Clifton Harold and anyone else that's associated, uh, Ms. Wood, Wood, Inga Wood, uh, to the table. I'll read item 6A. This is order 19-07-23-09 in the matter of approving the tentative agreement between Lane County and the Lane County Peace Officers Association. Um, and I see Ms. Holmes, our um, human uh, resources director, Inga Wood, our labor management, labor relations manager, uh, Sheriff Clifton Harold, and uh, Andrea Nagels from the Lane County Legal Counsel's Office, all here. And if you could introduce uh, anyone in the audience that you're aware of uh, that's here on this item, uh, we'll uh, turn it over to you, Ms. Nagels. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners, and I apologize, I'm getting over a little bit of a head cold, so. Um, would you like the introductions at this point for the yeah. members who have been able to join us today? Sheriff, do you want to do the honors? 
thought if I picked on the president, LCPOA <laughs> President Eric Churchill, and then why don't you uh, introduce your board. This is John Plessier, Bio Clean Man, <clears throat> Gerald Davis, and Guy Keys. Excellent. Well, welcome, and thanks so much for your service and for coming today. Go ahead, Ms. Nagels. Thank you. I am pleased to be here to present the tentative agreement for the labor contract between the county and Lane County Police Officers Association. This is an um, item where within the board packet we have a full uh, summary of the changes that, was, that were agreed to at the bargaining table as well as there's a full red line of the contract that shows all of the changes. I'm not gonna cover everything today, I'm just gonna note some of the highlights and some of the economic pieces that I wanted to make sure the board was aware of. This agreement covers approximately 270 Lane County employees. The majority of the employees in this group work within the Sheriff's Office. There's about 26 employees that work as juvenile group workers and they work at the detention facility and the Director of um, Youth Services, Nathleen, is here today as well. The LCPOA unit represents employees in 13 different classifications. The employees in this bargaining unit provide services within the Sheriff's Office and at Youth Services in the areas of corrections, patrol, communications, dispatch, records, facility operations, and correctional laundry services. Some of the um, highlights of the agreement is that it's a three-year contract, the tentative agreement that we agreed to. So if approved by this board, it would go into effect July 1 of 2019, and it would continue until June 30th of 2022. There is a wage adjustment provision through a cost of living adjustment under the agreement, and that's a 2% cost of living adjustment for all employees in the unit, and that would be for each of the three years of the contract. And those COLAs would go into effect the first full pay period following July 1 for each of the three years. To address market competitiveness with the county's comparators, there were some select classifications that were chosen for a wage scale adjustment and a market adjustment. And those classifications included the deputy sheriff, the communications specialist, the communications officer, public safety support specialist, and the communications network coordinator. And those new scales for the market adjustments will be effective the first full pay period following July 1 of 2019, contingent upon the board's approval. For employees in this unit in classifications that did not receive a market adjustment, the tentative agreement builds in a one-time payment for those employees and they, they will receive $300. The tentative agreement also provides external carry vest, which is a duty related item for the deputy sheriff classification. And we've also built in a footwear reimbursement for the deputies as well. The insurance provisions under the agreement remain generally the same as the current insurance levels that exist now. There are three plans available to Lane County employees and to this unit as well and employees continue to contribute a portion to the insurance coverage as an employee contribution based on the level of, based on the plan that they're in. If employees participate in the Live Well assessment, and that's available at the county's wellness clinic, then they can receive a $20 monthly credit towards their insurance contributions. The total costs for the proposed contract, and this is an additional cost above current operating expenses, is estimated at 4.1 million. This unit is funded by the general fund. It's also funded by the local option levy fund. And there is also some funding coming from the special revenue funds for the sheriff's office, public works, and health and human services. I am happy to report that um, LCPOA membership has voted on the contract and they have voted to approve. And so the next steps would be for the Board of County Commissioners to vote on the contract and the county's bargaining team recommends approval of the tentative agreement. That's all the information I have unless the, there are specific questions for me. Uh, also, if there's time, I'd like to open it up to the Sheriff and Ms. Wood to see if they have any additional comments. Okay, uh, Sheriff uh, Harold or Ms. Wood, would either of you like to make comments before we uh, 
let the board ask some questions or make comments. Uh, just really quick, I would like to just thank uh, LCPOA and also kudos to Ms. Nagels as the chief spokesperson for this unit. This is the first time since I've been at Lane County that we have gotten to a tentative agreement um, prior to the expiration of the contract with LCPOA, and so that just goes to show um, you know, the hard work that was done at the table and the relationships that um, we've built with this unit. I just want to thank um, everyone for that. And just to echo that is exactly what I wanted to share with the board. Actually, the, the most important thing I wanted to share was my gratitude to the bargaining teams. Um, we have a really terrific relationship with LCPOA right now, and I couldn't be more pleased that both sides were able to come into an agreement. I'm very happy with the agreement they came to. I think that it's um, appropriately strategically investing in the areas that we need to invest in for uh, the sheriff's office right now. And um, the fact that, that uh, both labor and management agreed on those strategic investments, also recognizing our resource level. Um, I couldn't be happier. Uh, I have to give some kudos to Chief Deputy Wilkerson, who isn't with us right now, but he was uh, on the bargaining team there at the end and um, called me uh, the day that they reached the tentative agreement, and I was uh, absolutely thrilled. And I woke up the next morning and remembered that he had called me and told me that, and I was thrilled all over again. So. Um, very happy that uh, we're here today to ask you to uh, approve it. Thank you so much. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions before we uh, move or comments before we move to a, a vote on the order? Commissioner Bozovich? Sure. I just want to real quick um, clarify maybe for the folks that might be watching all that. We talk about a step reconfiguration for the deputy sheriff classification. Was that the uh, drop the lowest step or is I can't I, we, we, we work on so many contracts now, I'm, I'm forgetting which, how we reconfigured their, their steps uh, in that classification. Yes, there, there was a reconfiguration of dropping the lowest step and then um, um, uh, an adjustment kind of to the scale. And then so employees will move to the closest step without a decrease and then move, you know, on their next merit based on where, where that falls. Okay. So we were addressing how we were out of market on the low end of, of um, experience level. Correct, we did uh, as part of our bargaining um, uh, prep work, we do a market review of all the classifications using our five county comparators and with the deputy sheriff classification, um, there is uh, what we were seeing, the numbers for those entry level positions, they were not as close to market as we would like to see. So that was part of the proposal to drop that first step on the scale. So then you're bumping up that entry level wage. For the other market adjustments that I mentioned, we I, I believe we did not drop any steps. That was just a scale adjustment. But with the deputy the sheriff classification. On, on, on the communications, was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of point that out a little bit for the audience because one of the things we're trying to do is make sure we are competitive in recruiting new officers um, as we look at the uh, the silver wave that's working our, our way through our, our all of government right now of retirements um, it, we, we need to be able to recruit um, quality individuals into this service and I think this contract helps address that and I want to thank um, you know our bargaining team and <clears throat> the membership uh, and leadership of the union for addressing that because I think that's really important to do. Um, and I also appreciate that there is a balance in this and it's and cost wise is not excessive and, and, it, and it enables us to maintain service levels at the same time. So uh, it was a great uh, piece of work by the bargaining team on both sides and I really appreciate the contract. Thank you. <clears throat> Further comments from commissioners? Um, I, I just want to ask a question about the uh, five county comparators and how that figured into the discussion. My understanding is uh, Lane County is using a so-called five county comparators method to uh, take a look at the uh, compensation across the board in the county from, from the top to uh, every other position in the county, whether it's in or out of a bargaining unit or not. And, and I just wanted to go over that. So are the five counties correctly stated as Jackson, Deschutes, Marion, Clackamas, and Washington counties? Are those the current five county con 
Okay. Yes, that's good. And I guess on the low end would be Jackson or Deschutes, and maybe on the high end would be uh, Clackamas and Washington. That's correct. Yeah. And if you're looking at population, and the closest in population in both location is Marion County. Yeah. So we got two that are a little bigger, two a little smaller, one that's almost the same. And that isn't the same in terms of tax base or ability to pay, because those are those are all above Lane County in terms of property taxation, uh, in terms of rate, uh, but they're all comparable in, in, the, in the aggregate, they're all comparable to Lane County. Right. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just a little bit of clarification. So this is a strike prohibited unit under Oregon's labor law. So if we weren't able to reach an agreement at the bargaining table, we ultimately would go through the impasse process, which would result in an interest arbitration hearing. There's an Oregon statute that provides if you get to that point, that what the party should be looking at for purposes of comparators, it's actually in statute that it's set by population and it's within the state of Oregon for the size of Lane County. So we're looking at similar counties within the state of Oregon that are close in population. So that has driven the conversation of why we have currently the five county comparators. Right. And we don't look at what private sector is paying, what the FBI is paying, what the Oregon State Police are paying. Even, we don't even look at what the city of Eugene or the city of Springfield is paying. We're just, we're, we're looking at these five county comparators, even though as a practical matter, um, you know, you're a lawyer in the Lane County Legal Counsel's office and there are lots of different jobs for lawyers in Eugene. You could go to work for a private law firm, you could work for the city government, you could work for the Attorney General's office, and you're your personal <laughs> comparators are not necessarily the five county comparators, but those are the ones we use for all of the positions in the county. And that, that was my point in making that is, it, it is a bit awkward in that uh, a, a peace officer that works for Lane County who's who could get a job with the city of Eugene or city of Springfield or state police, uh, they might be qualified for those jobs and they might be right in the same community where we're using comparators in Medford <laughs> and Bend. Uh, so I, I just think it's worthwhile to explain to the public as well as uh, the board itself uh, and everybody else that we're using the five county comparators for a reason. And the other reason is that the jobs are more comparable. The job of being a employee of Lane County is more comparable to being a, a, a employee of one of these other counties. I, I think it's, uh, it's a good system we're using. It has to be, you know, altered at times. Uh, we had the situation with nurses. Here you have a large hospital. Um, which we don't compare to uh, normally. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for your explanation on that. And uh, before we go to uh, getting a motion, are there other questions? Commissioner Bernie. Um, I just wanted to say that, that um, given that we live in the county, which my understanding is has the sixth lowest property tax rate in the state. Seventh. Pardon me? Seventh. Seventh, and thank you. And given that uh, we're looking at a $4.1 million increase over this budget item over the next few years, um, not only do I want to congratulate the, the county for running a, a structurally balanced budget, and not only do I want to acknowledge that this does not provide the service level of rural patrols that, that we all believe the county needs and deserves, but within the resource base that we do have, um, I also would like to congratulate the peace officers, the members of the association. They are the ones that now can continue to serve this county uninterrupted. Um, I would imagine if there's agreement being satisfied um, with the agreement, I know that they're passionate about their work and I know that our county is well served. So I just wanted to make that statement and I will certainly be approving this. Okay, Commissioner Buck. I just want to extend my appreciation to the, all the employees of LCPOA. Um, I appreciate your commitment to the service of Lane County and to the safety of our community as a whole. Um, I am absolutely supportive of your agreement um, and 
I will move to approve item 6A, order number 19-07-23-09 in the matter of approving the tentative agreement between Lane County and the Lane County Peace Officers Association. Okay, so it's been moved. Is there a second to approve second. the order? Seconded by, uh, uh, moved by Commissioner Buck, <coughs> seconded by Commissioner Bozovich to approve order 19-07-23-09. Uh, further comments uh, from commissioners on the uh, motion? Commissioner Farr. Uh, I guess I'll make it to the motion. I had a comment prior to the motion, but um, Sheriff, Lane County is approximately the size of Connecticut, is that right? Yes, indeed. Just can you let us know about how many uh, rural patrols deputies do we have right now as we sit here? We have uh, 25 budgeted deputy sheriff positions to provide rural patrol. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, your question was, how many do we have sitting? How many are on, this, on the road right now as we sit here? Uh, three. Three. Uh, Connecticut, three. Right. Okay. Which my point is the uh, tremendous amount of work and the tremendous amount of pressure that's placed on our public safety officers. Um, I, we all acknowledge that. I acknowledge it. And uh, the, uh, I, I cross paths with many of you in the morning as we walk in or in the afternoon as we walk out and you're never not smiling. You know, you guys love your work. That's clear. Um, and I'm proud to be a part of the work that you do. So thank you very much for being here today. And thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. I, I'll just say, uh, I just am very pleased with the cooperation shown in the negotiations, the discussion uh, on the part of uh, both the LCPOA and membership and the county bargaining team. I'd also like to say that that uh, one of the things that is uh, most important in the work we do as a county is public safety, and our charter sets up a department of public safety headed by the sheriff, and the people that do the work, uh, which is often very uh, uh, difficult, risky, uh, it's, it's, it's hard on the families, uh, of the officers, it's hard on the officers themselves, and we owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude for all the work you do. Uh, it's really important for our um, community, all the work you do, so thank you so much. Um, okay, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. The order is adopted as presented uh, by a vote of five to zero. All commissioners present voting aye. So thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Wood, I think you're retaining at the table. Yes. Okay, and at this time we'll move to order 19-07-23-10 in the matter of approving the tentative agreement between Lane County and the American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees Physicians Unit. Uh, and there, are there other people that uh, need to come up to the table or are you Ms. Nagels and Ms. Wood? It. No, we have two more people coming up to the table. We have one chair, but nope, we have two chairs. We have one chair. No, the chair's coming right with him. There it is. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> we only have one chair. I... Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Um, in the past, I have dis de declared a potential conflict of interest regarding discussions of uh, any AFSCME work group. Uh, we have received a uh, somewhat clarification from the uh, Oregon Ethics Commission that I most likely do not have a potential or a statutory conflict of interest when discussing the physician's unit. So I will remain in this discussion today. Okay, um, and uh, before we get started, uh, I'm wondering, Mr. Mokraisky, if you could alert Mr. Uh, Dingle that we're gonna try to take up his items be right after this, uh, before we move to the 11.15 uh, time certain. Do that. Yeah. You can also consider him so alerted because I think he. Oh, he is alerted. Very good. Okay. <laughs> I will reinforce that. Okay. So at this time, I'd like to um, turn it over to Ms. Wood. Is that correct? Okay. Ms. Wood, our director, uh, labor management uh, manager, excuse me, labor relations manager for Lane County, is here to uh, give us a briefing and introduce all the folks at the table. Uh, uh, first, introduce all the folks, and then give us a, a briefing on this uh, uh, tentative agreement. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Sorensen and Commissioners. And um, with me, I have uh, Ron Dome and Dr. Rick Kincaid. They were both um, pivotal in the negotiation team, so they were on our bargaining team through this whole process, and I appreciate them being here with us today. Um, I'm happy to present to you today the tentative agreement between Lane County and the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Physicians Unit, also known as AFSCME Physicians. This is the first contract between the county and the AFSCME physicians. Um, this covers physicians, uh, naturopathic physicians, and internal medicine phys physicians in our community health centers. The bargaining teams participated in contract negotiations and through that process have reached a tentative agreement for this contract. The teams concentrated on maintaining a competitive position in the labor market and providing cost of living adjustments to the represented positions while keeping focused on overall budget concerns constraints and maintaining a commitment to the county's strategic plan. The board is being asked to approve the proposed four-year agreement ending June 30th, 2023, which is included in this packet. Um, a brief summary of the proposed changes are also included in the packet, so like uh, Ms. Nagels did, I won't go through all of the details of the contract since it is brand new, everything is new, um, but I'd like to highlight a few items. Um, July of 2019, there's a proposal for market adjustments for employees in this group by dropping three steps from the compensation scale at the bottom and moving employees to the closest step without a decrease. Employees will then move to step seven of the newly established scale on the first full pay period following July 1st, 2019. Um, employees in this positions on the date of approval will also receive a one-time payment of $10,000. The tentative agreement provides for a 2% cost of living adjustment for the year two of the contract, um, which is fiscal year 2021, 2% 2 cost of living adjustment for year three of the contract, which is 21-22, and a 2% cost of living adjustment for the fourth year of the agreement, which is fiscal year 22-23. Um, so unlike some of our other agreements, this is a little bit unique in the sense it's a four-year agreement instead of a three-year agreement. Um, the health insurance plans and employee monthly co contributions will change effective January 1st, 2020. Previously, when these um, employees were represented under non-rep, some of them had access to our copay plan and some did not based on their hire date. Under the changes um, with this agreement, they would all have access to our copay plan, our high deductible health plan, and the prime plan. So all three would be available to any employee in this agreement regardless of their hire date. Um, for employees in the high deductible health plan, the monthly contribution will be $20 for employee only and $20 for employee plus other. For the prime plan, the monthly contribution will be $30 for employee only and $50 for employee plus other. And for the copay plan, the employee monthly contribution will be $50 for employee only and $70 for employee plus other. Effective January 1st of 2020 for employees on the copay plan, the office visit um, will increase from $25 per visit to $35 per visit. AFSCME physicians employees who complete all three parts of the annual Live Well Health Risk Assessment will receive a monthly credit of $20 to the employee's health contribution cost. For AFSCME physicians, employees who elect the high deductible health plan, the county will deposit an equal amount equivalent to the annual deductible based on their enrollment as an individual employee, $1,500, or employee plus other family, spouse, domestic partner, child for $3,000 into the employee's health savings account in the first full pay period following January 1st of each year of the agreement. The total estimated increased cost for the proposed contract changes is $1,754,227 over a four-year contract period. The employees in this bargaining unit provide services within the community health centers within the Department of Health and Human Services. These services are funded by the Health and Human Services Fund, which includes some transfer of discretionary general fund for public health. I wanna thank the bargaining team members for both the county and the AFSCME team um, specifically. And I don't, I in, invited them. I'm guessing that they're currently seeing patients today and that's probably why they were unable to attend. Um, but specifically, Dr. Moxie Loeffler, Dr. Mark Mueller, Larice Rivera, Pat Dotson, and Jim Steiner from AFSCME. 
and Dr. Rick Kincaid, Ron Jelm, Andrea Nagels, Sarah Chinsky, Kristen Mayfair, and Christine Moody from the county team. And I also just wanna thank Karen Gaffney and Steve Mokrahiski, um, who provided a tremendous amount of support um, through the negotiations in this process of a brand new agreement. The ratification of the contract is in alignment with the county's strategic priority, our people and partnerships, to provide a health, safe, healthy, and inclusive work environment that attracts and retains a diverse, highly skilled workforce with a deeply embedded commitment to delivering value and service to the residents of Lane County through fiscal resilience and partnerships. AFSCME Physician Bargaining Unit members have voted to ratify the tentative agreement. The county's bargaining team recommends approval of the agreement and authorization for the county to implement the proposed changes. And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions or any other comments. Okay, uh, would anyone else uh, like to make any comments before we uh, ask the commissioners if they have questions or comments? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'd just like to uh, make the comment that um, we found uh, this process uh, to be both uh, challenging and promising. Uh, challenging in um, obviously uh, time frame, uh, challenging in the emotional energy, challenging uh, even looking at the costs uh, and um, how we operate. Uh, but at the same time, promising uh, in that uh, we've established imp uh, opportunities for enhanced communication, uh, increased engagement, better input uh, and ultimately um, easier recruitment uh, and maintaining our workforce of high, these highly skilled physicians. So uh, it's a, a balancing act. Uh, and again, I do appreciate our uh, council and our team, uh, mm -hmm. as well as the input that we received um, through the process um, uh, because it was very helpful as we framed the discussion. So thank you. Uh, I would just like to uh, echo uh, Dr. Kincaid's comments uh, and express my appreciation uh, to uh, our bargaining team and Inga, who did a wonderful job in leading us through this first time process, uh, as well as to the members of uh, AFSCME uh, and their negotiating team. It was the first time through the process, uh, I know particularly for uh, Drs. Mueller and Loeffler. Uh, we were all learning along the way, and I think uh, through this uh, process have developed a stronger relationship and the foundation to move forward on some critically important items. And so we look forward to uh, the ratification of the agreement um, and moving on to uh, important work of serving patients. Good. Okay, commissioners, do you have any questions or comments? Commissioner Buck? I just want to appreciate both sides' commitment to getting to yes. I know it took a long time to get here and a lot of work, and I appreciate all that time and energy um, to get to yes. Uh, and I think ultimately this is for the benefit of the community and the people in which we serve. So I want to extend that to you and to both of you as well. I know you were critical in... Um, making sure that communication flowed. Uh, so thank you both Dr. Kincaid and Dr. Helm for doing so. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, when, when uh, employees are, are forming a bargaining unit under Oregon, uh, you know, collective bargaining law, and they form that uh, bargaining unit, and then they start uh, uh, the <coughs> process of, of getting approved and certified and everything, and then there's the bargaining, and it's always the first time. It's the first time through all this. And it's the first time for the, for the uh, physicians. It's the first time for the county uh, um, staff that's that's uh, negotiating with the physicians uh, and so it's a much harder uh, uh, thing because it's an educational process and uh, it is new and everyone is kind of <clears throat> going through it in a in a new way um, I think it's really great as, as Commissioner Buck just pointed out it's great that that after the bargaining and bargaining and back and forth that uh, eventually we get to yes and we need to thank everybody involved the physicians who are the members of the bargaining unit and uh, the staff here you folks um, it seems to me that that's a uh, a real a good thing to celebrate that we got to yes on this. Um, 
And uh, without further ado, then I'll up. Oh, we have another taker. Always late. Always uh, it's late. okay. Uh, after your comments, I'll uh, Commissioner Bernie. I'll entertain a motion to approve the order as presented. Thank you for your continuancy, continuing leniency, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to give you a different perspective than the comments of joy and celebration <laughs> that have been made thus far. I'm not so convinced it won't always be difficult to get doctors and lawyers and administrators and commissioners <laughs> to agree on anything. However, you did it, everyone's happy, and I'm delighted that we can move forward um, without additional time and energy. Um, having been privy for the first time ever in my life to a process of the give and take from the outside, not the inside. Um, uh, it's also amazing the, the, the amount of time necessary to get to yes. I was flabbergasted. I'm delighted we're here. Thank you all so much. Okay, uh, at this time I'll entertain a motion to approve the order uh, as presented. So moved. Second. Okay, it's been moved by Commissioner Bernie, second by Commissioner Buck to approve order 19-07-23-10. Uh, further comments, Commissioner Bozovich. To the motion, I'm, I'm going to be voting against this motion, and it's not about the contract. It's about the fact that I did not support the decision that this could be a unit that could be formed in the first place, and it's a protest vote against that decision by the state. Okay. Uh, further comments. Okay. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> the vote is uh, four to one. Commissioner uh, Bozovich voting no, and four commissioners voting in the affirmative. The order is adopted as presented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're now ready to go back to our. Why do I have? Oh, there we go. We're ready to call up. Uh, item number 8A, which is the County Council announcements, and then I've created another thing called item 8B, which is called the release of County Council opinion in ORS 294.100. So as the first item is the announcements, uh, I'll call on Mr. Dingle to make any announcements, and then when he's done, I'll call up the other item. Thank you, uh, Chair Sorensen and, and uh, members of the board. Just a couple of quick items. Um, I wanted to let you know that I've been working with uh, the McKinsey River Discovery Center. They've renamed themselves. These are the folks that made the presentation about uh, an interpretive center slash museum with the old fish hatchery. We will soon be executing a facility use permit, which will give them access to the location, which they want to do some work in anticipation of, I believe you're going to receive an invitation to, I think it's August 24th, that they're going to invite elected officials to come up and see their plans. And then also part of that is uh, the, um, that option, or that facility use permit includes an option for a long-term lease. I just wanted to update you on that. I didn't know that they had sent those, uh, the invitation out. And Commissioner Bernie, we will certainly follow up with you on the uh, your comments about the sole source. I can tell you that Generally speaking, what that means is that we have put it out for a notice. It just turns out if you look at the types of services that were involved there, they tend to be extremely unique. And, and it tends to be that the person who has that contract, the, the county is the only consumer of those services, so it tends to go. It's, uh, it tends to continue on. I appreciate that. But I'll have you something in that. I'll include the rest of the board, too. And then moving to AB, there was um, some discussion we had an executive session on this matter, and I can't remember when that was, two weeks ago, three weeks ago? It, it, anyway, it involved uh, the potential liability uh, for the board members uh, around the issue of referring some of these measures that have been discussed, specifically um, the personal liability in ORS 294-100. Uh, there seemed to be interest in uh, having an open session to discuss the sort of back and forth with the, uh, the legal issues. And I told the board that based on previous board's uh, policy, they had reached a, uh, a, 
an agreement that uh, it would take three members to waive attorney-client privilege. I supported that so that we didn't inadvertently waive. And so uh, I think the first thing today is to, if in a, ahead of that potential um, or that work session, it would be to have the board waive the attorney-client privilege, the memo that um, was provided as the basis of the executive session. Uh, it would be my expectation that once that happens and we get the, uh, and we'll decide, uh, we can talk about the scheduling. I've got some information from some of the folks who are interested in it as well as Ms. Jones. We can talk about uh, when that gets posted, but essentially what, what that would mean is the material uh, on behalf of the county that would be uh, made available to the public ahead of time would be that opinion. Uh, and the, um, um, and the attachments, not just the memo, but there was a number of, you'll recall a number of different things that were attached to it. So if the if it is that board's intention, then I think you do need to uh, have the, at least three members uh, agree to waive the that as the first step in that process. Okay, and uh, to be clear, uh, in terms of the memo that you prepared that the board has reviewed in executive session, to be clear, that does include uh, uh, as attachments to it and as part of the waiver that we may be uh, doing here, uh, that also includes the materials you've received from other people that are, um, that, that were reviewed by county council in coming to your opinion. So it's not just your opinion, I mean, that is what we're releasing, but it's also the underlying materials as well. Is that correct? Uh, Chair Sorensen, that's correct. Actually, I believe that every single I believe every single attachment is actually a public record. There's the, I know that there are the uh, three Lane County Circuit Court opinions, which are obviously public records. Uh, there's the Court of Appeals opinion in Gedre. Um, and, I, and I believe there's also correspondence from, some, uh, from the Oregon Farm Bureau. I know at least the Oregon Farm Bureau that indicated uh, that discuss potential litigation if the board were to refer it. So the, the court opinions, both trial and, and appellate, and the uh, legal opinion of the Oregon Farm Bureau, as well as your office's legal opinion, is all what we're talking about when we talk about waiving attorney-client privilege. Of course, we don't really need to waive attorney-client privilege on published documents, but that's what we're talking about, a packet of all that. Yes. Uh, okay. And so, to be fair, the one, the one, I mean, just to be really clear, the one Court of Appeals decision that, uh, pertains to uh, the first ruling related to this was was simply an AWOP, uh, yeah. affirmed without opinion. There's not actually a discussion like yeah. that is getting. Okay, so uh, I'm sure other commissioners have questions about this possible waiver. I'll call on Commissioner Bozovich. So at, at, I support the waiver, but I believe it is important for us when we waive attorney-client privilege to do it by a formal action of the board, yeah. which um, rather than just a head nod, sort of thing um, and I and rather than do a, a motion from the floor and, and have the some of the unclarity around that I would ask that the staff prepare a board order to be on consent our next consent calendar um, that formalizes us waiving our attorney client privilege in releasing the report on this particular uh, aspect of our 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 the liabilities around referral of a of a would, would you be open if they were able to do that before the end of this meeting would you be open to sure, having as this? long as we have okay. a formal board order yeah. and there's a recorded vote on that board order yeah I, I just that I, it's important to me to protect our attorney client privilege and the only time it should be waived is by an action of the majority of this board in a formal action you know and just head nodding is not good enough for me to have us start waiving our attorney-client privilege. So that, okay. that, that's all I, uh, my only concern around this. I fully support release of, of this, this memo. Um, I think it's important to let everybody take a look at, you know, some of the information we're getting around our legal liabilities. Okay, other commissioners want to make any comments regarding the issue before we entertain a motion to direct County Council to prepare that um, board order? Commissioner Bernie. Um, just to be clear, um, I'm in complete agreement with Commissioner Bozovich, but I want to ask County Council, do you see any negatives in releasing this information? Uh, no. Uh, 
now that we've had the discussion in executive session, I mean, it, it is, to be clear, you know that it, uh, it contains my opinion, so it would be, uh, it's out there that your lawyer would be saying certain things, which right. is not ordinarily the case, and that's really the client's call, but I, I don't see any legal negatives to that. Thank you, sir. I, I guess I should say a caution, depending on what the board ultimately decides to do. Yeah. Right, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, let's just see if we can get a motion here to direct uh, County Council to prepare a board order and if possible to have us vote on that board order later in the meeting if it is provided and our agenda is uh, modified to show it. Um, could I entertain a motion for that? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to direct County Council to uh, prepare board order, uh, perhaps later in this meeting, uh, perhaps uh, next week, depending on the workflow, to, um, to uh, um, release the legal opinion and attachments that the board received on the topic of uh, county council opinion on ORS 294.100. So it's been moved by Commissioner Bozovich, seconded by Commissioner Buck to uh, make that motion and uh, further discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion carries five to zero. So, uh, Mr. Dingley, you have your, your direction from the board. I can get, I'm confident I can get that to the board. Uh, okay. By the end, of, by before the end of the meeting today. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, and um, now, where are we on our, where are our, our uh, our first uh, or scheduled, I guess the time certain scheduled is 11.15. Do we have time to do the other executive session item I, at this time? Uh, yes, we have an 11.15 time certain, and I did get um, the person who's gonna be making the call, Ms. Lords, did send me some material okay. that she wanted me to give to the board a letter, so I was hoping that perhaps you'd have a little bit of a break so that each of you would have an opportunity. It's not long, it's two or three pages, but it, it okay. an opportunity, two pages, uh, to review. We could break till 11. The other thing is, I didn't know if they wanted, if you wanted to discuss, um, we, we mentioned the waiver of the attorney-client privilege. If you wanted to, we, I've received um, some communication, I believe it was forwarded from Commissioner Bernie, regarding the structure of that, if you want to take that up now or if you want to do it at the end of the uh, My preference would be to uh, read what uh, Ms. Lords sent and secondly have the executive session 1115 and then have the other executive session uh, before we launch into that. And also, I think it's appropriate to have the release of the materials before we go into a um, just so that people that, that want to read all that can can read that in consideration of how we want to structure the the um, work session. Um, we'll, we can also bring that up under under uh, um, review of assignments and you know because uh, we, we we have a list of of items that we need to review. The board needs to review. Commissioner Bernie. And and just to be clear, um, I did not submit anything I forwarded to the, right no that's okay I forwarded um, to those that that are involved in this the input from the the community rights group just as an honorable thing to do so that they they knew that their input was being looked at as we consider how we want to approach this so uh, mr. Dingle it's about a quarter till uh, we have our time certain at 11 15 uh, what do you think of this plan we we recess we review the written material. Uh, we convene at 11 for the purpose of your other executive session. And then at 11.15, we continue the executive session. Is that, would that work? Okay. So, Mr. Chair, yes, sir. I'll give you the okay, so um, at this time, I'm gonna read our executive session into uh, it's item nine on our executive session um, and Thank you. This time, the Board of Commissioners will meet in executive session to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to negotiate uh, real property transactions and to consult with counsel regarding the rights and duties of a public body regard to current litigation or litigation likely to be filed. 
this executive session is held pursuant to RS 192.6602 E and H, which allows the Board of Commissioners to meet in executive session for the purposes listed. Representatives of the news media and designated staff shall be allowed to attend the executive session. All other members of the audience are asked to leave the room. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report on any of the deliberations during the executive session, except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No decision may be made in executive session. We reserve the right to come back out into public session should the need arise, and the need will arise. So at this time, um, we're going to uh, recess the Board of Commissioners, <clears throat> um, and then we're going to reconvene the Board of Commissioners in executive session in the Board of Commissioners Conference Room at uh, 11 p.m., 11 a.m., and uh, we'll continue with our time certain executive session and uh, uh, reserve the right to come out of executive session um, at some point between uh, 11.30 and uh, 1.30, but in the event we do not reconvene, we will reconvene uh, at 1.30 p.m for our public works items. Any questions before we uh, recess the board? So we're in recess, then we'll convene in executive session at 11.15, I mean 11. <laughs>